My favorite science term is bovine spongiform encephalopathy. It is a kind of TSE or transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, which basically means it's something that turns your brain into Swiss cheese. That's the spongiform. When you do autopsies on things that have a TSE, you find that their brain is like a sponge. It's full of holes. We only know of a few TSEs. There's less than a dozen that we know of. This is chronic wasting disease like in deer and mad cow disease, which is the bovine spongiform encephalopathy, like I said, <laughs> like I said before. And they are nearly, or they might as well be, 100% fatal. And they are caused by things, we think they are caused by things that we call prions, which are little packets of misformed proteins that when they come into contact with other proteins, they misform them. And then it kind of causes a whole chain reaction of you're going to not make it. I mean, there's not a whole lot to add to that. They terrify me. And now so you. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another edition of Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all of your nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions, and shameless requests for me to shout you out during this episode and address them. <laughs> and that reminds me, I just want to give a quick shout out to the- Now, because of the Thanksgiving holiday, I was not actually able to look at all of your comments, corrections, and questions on the Flash lightsaber episode, the last episode on this channel. So instead of referring to those corrections comments, which I'm sure there must be very few, I, am, I bet I nailed it, I am instead taking a number of your suggestions and comments and questions from over the last few months that haven't really fit anywhere else, and I'm going to address them here as more of an evergreen episode of Footnotes. If you want to, and like alliteration, call it a, a simple sampling of science questions. Don't give me that face, it works. So what did you have to say over the last indeterminate amount of time? The first question comes from Maka Woodworking, who says, is it possible for the Flash to undo a tornado by running in the opposite direction? I actually get this question a lot, and I don't think so. What is the Flash? The Flash is a man. He's a man-sized thing. And what does the Flash do? He runs really fast. So when the Flash runs, he will be pulling air around him, moving air around him in accordance with his shape the boundary layer, if you want to get all fluid dynamic-y with it. Right at the edge of the flash is where all of the fluid interaction, air is a fluid, all the fluid interaction will be happening on his body, and that's where he will be pulling stuff along. My point in saying that is, if you get away from this boundary layer, away from this man-sized thing, even if it's going very, very fast, it's not gonna affect a large weather system. Think of it this way, if you've ever taken the subway and stood right next to the tracks or gone up to a train crossing, stood right next to the tracks, you sh shouldn't do that. A lot of people have died taking selfies that way in India. Anyway, if you've ever done that, you know if you stand right next to a train as it's passing by, you'll feel a huge whoosh of wind. That's because it is dragging air along, along this boundary layer outside of the train. But if you stand just a couple of feet or a couple of meters back from the train, you don't really feel anything at all. And that's my point with the Flash. He's a man-sized thing. Even if he's going very, very fast and running in a circle in the opposite direction of a tornado, he's not gonna be moving that much air around him or above him in the opposite direction. Tornadoes can be miles across. So to affect a weather system like that, I do not think just running on the ground in a circle, even if you're going really, really fast, will do the trick. No, I do not think the Flash really would have that power. Not without at least going so fast that he's causing more destruction on the ground than the tornado itself is causing. Our next comment comes from Alex Brockmeyer, who looks like he's commenting on the Predator invisibility episode, who says, invisibility would impact not just your own sight, but also thermal regulation. Unless you could specifically bend only the visible spectrum of light away from you, you couldn't absorb heat energy from the infrared spectrum, and you'd be an invisible freeze boy. Well, that's true. To make invisibility work in a more realistic way, you'd have to pick and choose the parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that you would want to divert away from you. If you're diverting everything, then you're not getting heat light, infrared radiation hitting your body, and you would be very cold, and you'd get colder as your body emitted heat, about 100 joules per second. You're kind of like a big, meaty light bulb. And if you could divert things specifically, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, you'd only divert visible light, right? 
because you wouldn't want anyone to see you, but then you're still emitting infrared light, which people could easily pick up with a nice infrared camera, which would kind of invalidate the whole concept of invisibility to everyone in the first place. Where did they go? Oh. Our next question comes from DJ Smurls, who says, in Willy Wonka, the original, the better one, ooh, hot take, DJ, shouldn't Augustus have been killed by the pressure in the pipe sucking him out of the river? Well, this is a fun question. I think the problem would be not so much getting sucked into the pipe by a large differential pressure, but being pinned up against the pipe. That's really the problem. So imagine if there was a grate on the pipe and Augustus got sucked down into the chocolate river and was pressed up against that grate because there's low pressure on one end of the pipe going into the intake and high pressure on the other side from the chocolate river forcing him down into the pipe or you know if it's creating suction with a pump or something like that. He would get forced up against the grate and because the pressure differential would be so high he wouldn't be able to move at all even if you went down there and tried to grab him away from the pipe, he would be pressed up against it so hard that he would just stay under there and drown. And I get so dark with this because this is an actual problem. When people like divers go down to check the intake pipes or uh, grates for dams, there have been cases where divers, because of the pressure differential, have been pressed up against the grate. And then even though they have oxygen tanks and stuff down there, the pressure is so strong, they just stay up against the pipe, they can't move and they drown under there. So I think that would be the real problem. And if the pipe was an open pipe and it wasn't the same size as Augustus, it could be even more of a problem because I've seen deep sea crabs literally crushed in half and into pieces by the high differential pressure between an underwater pipe and just their bodies and all of the sea above them. So. I do not think that just going into the pipe is the problem getting stuck and then forced through. It would be getting caught near or around or on the pipe that's the real problem. And I don't think that the original, better Willy Wonka, would have gone that far in depicting the death of a child. It was all there against the pipe, clear as crystal. Augustus drowned in all that chocolate and we had to wash and sterilize it so you get his body. Good day! <laughs> Our next question, answered very casually, comes from Sean Anderson, who says, Kyle! <laughs> my family and I love your show. I'm not sure if we'll ever have our act together to watch Because Science Live, but my daughter and I have a question that we hope you'll answer someday. Ho oh, ho! That day is today. Casually. A. Why is human blood red? B, what chemical causes other colors in alien fantasy blood? And C, could an Earth-based vampire live off the blood of anything from a different planet? Let's take this point by point and very casually as we do so. Human blood is red because it has something called hemoglobin in it, and in that hemoglobin is the element iron. When iron is a part of a complex like hemoglobin, it just happens to reflect red wavelengths of light. To your next point, and casually, if you had another kind of chemical or element in a fictional animal's blood that reflected a different wavelength of light, you could get a different color. And we don't even have to speculate about this. Horseshoe crabs, as you can see here, have a compound that's like hemoglobin, but instead of iron, they have copper. And this reflects blue wavelengths of light in their blood, and so their blood is actually blue. And there's other examples that you can find in the animal kingdom, a lot of worms, that have green or even purplish blood. And to your last point, casually, could an Earth vampire drain an alien's blood without issue? I do not think so. Blood is blood, but it has a lot of different properties like proteins on the outside of red blood cells and such that make it hard to share blood among other people. That's why it's so important to know what your blood type is. Vampires, if they're a real thing on Earth, would probably evolve to deal with certain kinds of blood and certain kinds of proteins on the blood and stuff like that. If you went to an alien world, Alien blood probably evolved in a completely different way than anything here on Earth. You would expect it to. It's a different planet, different conditions, unless it was exactly like Earth. So just like you can't donate type A blood to someone with type B blood, I think it would be very hard for a vampire to find a suitable nutritional source in alien blood because it would be so alien. So you heard it here first. If you're a vampire on Earth, don't suck an alien. 
Our next comment comes from C4BZ, who says, hey, Kyle, can't, he didn't say that. Hey, can science explain the powers of Guinness World Record holder Jamie Keaton? And would someone with his condition perhaps be able to scale walls like Spider-Man? Thanks. Okay, so here is Jamie Keaton. His world record is for the most number of cans stuck to his head at one time for an amount of time. And I'm gonna get a little salty with this one because things like this are held up as powers that science cannot explain. And it's usually something like magnetic. Ooh, that magnetic kid who can stick a number of forks to his face and it doesn't fall off. These people have very smooth skin, a lot of skin, and it produces more oil than the average person, so it can seem stickier. This Jamie guy can stick cans on his head because he's putting his skin, he's fitting it underneath inside the can, and it kind of expands. It's kind of like a reverse plunger, and his he's got a shaved, very shaved close head, so you can, it's just very smooth skin, and it probably is kind of oily. This is not a superpower. This is not something that science cannot explain. If you put baby powder on his head and tried the same thing, it wouldn't work. I've seen that debunk other magnetic people. And furthermore, in the article on Guinness, it says the doctor said, oh, I can't explain that. His, his pores must be just sucking in oxygen, which forms a suction cup. No, dude just got a big, sticky, full of skin head. But could you use an ability like this to scale a wall like Spider-Man? Definitely not. Like a gecko's legs or a spider's legs use Van der Waals forces, which uh, take advantage of nanoscale protrusions on a skin surface to adhere to that surface. Uh, this is just, like I said, a lot of sticky skin. Do you know what this guy's skin is like? It's like those kitchen pads that are plastic that feel like they can stick to stuff really well. That's just because of the kind of material and how much you have of it and what's on it and how the surfaces interact. It's not a superpower. He's just a big sticky man. <laughs> But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this evergreen episode, I'm giving to Ross O'Shea because it's a great example of working through problems with critical thinking skills, which I'm always trying to get at with all of my videos. Ross says, hey Kyle, I recently watched your Truth About Space War video, which I found fascinating and also crushing. As a former soldier, this led me down a train of thought familiar to most problem solvers. Uh, if your cool new kit doesn't work, go back to the basics. Ross goes on to say, instead of using lasers or particle beams or fancy weapons like that, why not just use like the equivalent of a ballista or like a catapult on the outside of your spaceship? Even a 50 gram steel bearing f flying through space would do a lot of damage to anything that got in its way. This would cut down on automation, remove the need for explosive materials on the ship, massively reduce the energy consumption without lasers, and allow for ammunition to be stored externally, blah, 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 blah. Would love to hear your thoughts on the idea, and it might even be worthy of a BS footnote. <laughs> now, as I've said publicly and in some videos, you are exactly right, Ross, and I'm mentioning this because you came to this just working through your own critical thinking skills and thinking about what we were talking about and establishing assumptions and then working from there. Yes, some of the deadliest things in a space war would be the simplest. You could just put on a rocket on the back of a rock and fire it at a planet. If it was far enough away and it had enough time to accelerate, by the time it got there, let's say a month later, it would be going so fast that it would have the impacting power like a nuclear weapon or worse. Imagine putting a dozen rockets on the back of a large asteroid and moving it towards, you know, the fleet or the home planet or something like that. You could get very, very simple. Yes, just a steel ball bearing fired at velocity would travel forever. There's no air resistance. It's not gonna be curved unless it goes near a gravity well and it would impact and do serious, serious damage. So Ross, your assumptions are perfectly accurate. You don't have to get super sci-fi with laser weapons, plasma weapons, you know, antimatter rockets and stuff like that. Out in space, some of the simplest weapons could be some of the best. And for working all of that out yourself and using your critical thinking skills, you are indeed, Ross, a super nerd. <laughs> Now, if you are already casually subscribed to Alpha, which you can do at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is gonna be, because you saw it two days earlier than anyone else. Lucky you. <laughs> but if you're not subscribed to Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science, no, I'm just keeping it cash. The next episode of Because Science is gonna be
Can you turn a whole city into a dang car? That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we are taking a thought experiment that was just too good to pass up and we are evaluating it fully in the new movie, Mortal Engines. The concept is basically, turn an entire city into a vehicle that eats other cities. You just can't pass that kind of opportunity up. How much would that city weigh? How fast would it go? How much fuel would you need? We're figuring it all out, and may I say, pretty dang casually too. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science if you haven't yet. Leave me all your nerdiest comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. Or not. Cash. And don't forget, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around every once in a while, you could miss it. There it goes!